<clears throat> okay, we are recording. Uh, joining me today, Simon Nickel. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Stu. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, I've had a I've had a quick tour <laughs> before we press record. I've seen your uh, your glorious. Um, shed or or, or uh, it's a posh looking shed and i could hear the yeah. birds singing in the background and then you you, you, you spun the the, the the laptop around so I, I had a quick nose it looks very glorious where whereabouts is that today as well uh we're halfway between canterbury and dover oh, down lovely. in east Kent. lovely yeah it's, lovely. it's all right if you like truck uh, truck spotting <laughs> it's not one of my favorite pastimes i won't lie <laughs> Right, Simon, how we do this, um, we start the playlist and uh, and I'm going to ask you, um, as I always do uh, with my guests, to kick things off. I'd like you to tell me the song that you think has the greatest ever intro. Yeah, well, when, when, I, when I had notice of this question, I was immediately put in a dichotomy. I could not decide between two, but eventually I had to plump for one. Um, I'll tell you the one I, that nearly made it, mm. and then I'll tell you the proper one. Um, at the top of Like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan on the Bringing It All Back Home album, uh, that song starts with a cracking downbeat on the snare drum, just out of the blue. And as I think it was him, who was uh, Dylan Monik, one of the Nashville scene guys. Uh, Put it beautifully, he said, that sound of that snare drum, when you hadn't heard the song before and you had no idea what was coming, was like a door being smashed open into a whole world of music which hadn't existed till that very moment. And it's short, punchy, it couldn't be any more direct, and it's not what people think of as an intro, but to me, it really does make your hairs on the back of your neck stand up. However, I think it was trumped by the opening chord of A Hard Day's Night. Again, couldn't be more concise, couldn't be more identifiable. Uh, and although it didn't usher in a whole new world, it summed up what the Beatles had done up to that point and said, hey, we're not just what we've done up to now. There's a whole world in front of us. And the great thing about that chord is it sounds like it's, you know, a lot of people used to say, oh, that's just easy. You just like turn an electric guitar up and smash the strings without touching the, you know, without using your left hand at all. But of course it isn't that. It's a quite a carefully uh, constructed thing and you can't play it on one guitar. Oh, really? Uh, no, you need, you need two guitars and a bass guitar. But the songs, the, the, the notes that come out of those three instruments when they're constructed properly make that, unique full chord yeah yeah it's it's so it, interesting isn't it how like uh, like a rolling stone and hard day's night it's just one sound and that one split second sound you already know what's coming because you yeah. know that and and you look at these long well-crafted intros such as you know aforementioned ones on this podcast things like bohemian rhapsody that have got these long yeah you know, masterful, well put together. You don't have to do that. If you can no, you nail don't. it that quickly, yeah, and that yeah, cleverly, yeah. that's an art form in itself, right? It is. I mean, the introduction is setting the scene. I mean, when you say introduction, uh, my first thought in the wider world of music is what happens at the top of an opera or a, a musical comedy, you know, something... It, it's it's or a, a, one of the great um, Rodgers and Hammerstein film musicals. You know, over the titles, you'll get an introduction, which is a snapshot of things to come. Little trailer pieces, all carefully, beautifully blended together, giving you some of the highlights of the songs and tunes to come. But uh, yeah, it's it's all about setting the scene, get wetting people's appetite and getting them ready for the whole main meal. An amused bouche of music before a fabulous banquet. Absolutely. But as you say, it can be encapsulated and there's absolutely no doubt about what's coming next. And yeah. the first time you hear it, it, it just like puts you to attention and makes you, makes you stand up and pay, pay notice. Yeah. I think the, the, the Beatles also, it's quite similar with Help as well, wasn't it? It's just that, 
that first yelp of the word help and you're in yeah uh, yes you are yeah yeah um, i mean yeah. T- talk a little bit simon about um you, you, obviously you've spent many years songwriting and i just want oh, to no, no I, I must pull you up there sir uh i've never been a songwriter i've okay. written i've written two and a half songs in the last 55 years so i wouldn't <laughs> say <laughs> I, I wouldn't wanted, say i want to discuss the half <laughs> What's the well, half? I, <laughs> Okay, the half, that's a song called What Tyler, Mm. which is um, uh, a historical interpretation of the proceedings around the uh, Peasants' Revolt of 1381. Mm. Uh, Obviously, not a subject many bands would want to tackle. Mm. (laughs) But uh, I think it was in the early 90s, um, and it's on an album from Fairport in that period. Now, Ralph Attell is a very good friend and... uh, a massively experienced songwriter and a genius at turning thoughts and, and ideas into singable lyrics. Um, and some reason or other, I mean, he'd written a few songs specifically for Fairport in the previous 10 years. And he's very, you know, close to the band. He's probably one of the people who's closest to the band without actually ever being considered to be, you know, a member, you know, yeah. a touring member of the group. But uh, a lot of our songs that have lasted the best have been a, started life in his brain. Anyway, he wanted to, he was, he was, he, he'd looked into the story of what Tyler and how he came to be in those days, um, how he came to be a national figure representing an, uh, um, a real peasant's revolt against the powers that be so long ago. And, um, he'd found some things out about the story which were appealing and cinematic to him. He he wanted to tell the story in a bit more detail about how his relationship facing up to the young Richard II, who was obviously the the monarch of all he surveyed back then, but was still only about 14 or 15 at the time. Uh, And they had a face-off meeting in London and one thing led to another and eventually uh, it turned into a scuffle and what Tyler was killed on the spot by the then Lord Mayor of London. So this all sounded like a great idea for a story, but but Ralph had got so far with sketching out the lyric form, because to tell a story like that, you've got to, you've got to do it in ballad form. Uh, it's got to have a continuous rolling narrative that keeps the, the, the images flashing through your mind and makes it tellable. Uh, and he got so far and no further, and he said, come on, Simon, you, you've got a way with words. We can do this. Come on, come around my place and we'll... We'll thrash it out. So we sat down in his garden on a, it was a pleasant spring morning, I think it was. And we, uh, he got all these books out and he showed me what the salient points of the narrative were as he saw it. And uh, anyway, that's, that's what happened. We eventually knocked it into shape, made it singable and not too long. Yeah. And uh, so that's my half song credit. I would never <laughs> have never been inspired to write songs. Uh, and I'm still not now because I think it's it's like any form of creative art. You've got to get the cliches out of your system first. Yeah. You know whether it's like learning to do watercolors, or or write a song or write a novel. You've got to start off with the short stories, um, and burn your way through all these shortcuts and cliches and oft repeated things. Yeah. Uh, tear up your first thousand songs and then you'll write one. I just don't have that kind of application. Yeah. Anyway, back to your question. Okay, I'm going to ask you for track two to tell me the first song that you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please. Uh, well, we're going to go back to Bob Dylan here. Um, yeah, uh, long before I thought of music as anything other than a spectator sport. I mean, I, I loved listening to music when I was a, you know, in my primary school years. And all sorts of music, you know, but I didn't uh, didn't bring much of it into the house myself. You know, there's my parents' choice of music, my big sister's choice of music. Uh, so what sort, of stuff, sort of, what sort of stuff was that, Simon? What sort of music were you being well, exposed I, to at home? Um, well, for mum and dad, that would have been sort of classics, light classics, and um, big band jazz wartime music mm-hmm. um, stuff that they grew up with but quite quite a broad uh, quite a broad range I mean I went to one or two classical concerts at Kenwood House 
in North London because uh, we lived down the hill in Muswell Hill from Hampstead, and that was a that was a place they liked to go on a summer's yeah. evening. There were you know concerts in the in the park there at Kenwood, uh, and uh, my dad liked Duke Ellington. Uh, when I was eight, he took me to see Ellington at the Astoria of Finsbury Park wow. with his big band, and that was that was uh, the first time. I went to a concert of that nature yeah. and got the feeling of what it was like to be in a house in the dark with, you know, 1500 music fans listening to this. Well, what seemed like to be, well, it was very powerful music. I mean, it was a whole Duke Ellington orchestra. And uh, obviously most, most of, most of the content went clear over my head yeah. as you'd expect, but the, the vibe that I got from being in that performance space and the energy and the power of it all that uh, obviously stayed with me. Yeah, but I mean, when I when I when I started to respond to music lyrically, I think Bob Dylan had a, a great deal to do with that. He wasn't the only singer songwriter, but he was the the man carrying the flag for it, you know. Yeah. And uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis of '62. 63 um he came out with masters of war and we'd all got it into our heads as you know young adolescent boys and girls that we were very likely to die not just individually but we were all going to be wiped out by nuclear war it was a very real thing and and it you called into question all sorts of things about your future and your life and what was it why am I going to school? You know, I don't enjoy getting out of bed and getting in my uniform and going to school on the bus. What's the point? You know, we're all going to be like charcoal just as soon as one of these madmen presses a button. Uh, and Masters of War is a, you know, it's it's all sorts of things in retrospect, you know, the way he he's taken um, a traditional form and a lyric and, and a tune uh, and reinterpreted and rewritten a lyric based on the, the whole idea of the in inevitability of death, but bringing it into focus as a, as a human artifact. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was very moved by that. So that's why I came up with that answer for your question. If you had to pinpoint the emotion, Simon, what would it have been? Uh, it's many many it's a cocktail of emotions isn't it it's the it's the why me why why was i born in this era you know <laughs> why are we all going to die when i'm just got the world at, at my feet you yeah. know when i'm in in five years time i'll be through with school you know i'll be starting a life it'll be a clean palette why is this being taken away and the folly you know the continuing folly of man's inhumanity to man and it's yeah. it's just the ghastly tribalness that we've somehow ever still got it at the very roots of our beings when we speak of societies yeah. you know why do we have this need to cleave to one particular football club yeah. and feel superior and and to dismiss uh, other people because they have a different language or they keep their Sabbath on a different day. Yeah, it's just tribal. It's the the, the biggest evil. Yeah, and and obviously we're, we're we're currently living in a world where that's as prevalent as as ever. And, well, in 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 our society at the moment, you know, xenophobia is having a wonderful time. Yeah, at yeah. the expense of expense of simple humanity and recognizing that, you know, we're always going to have more in common than we've got to separate us. Yeah. Hundred um, percent. I'm at an age where I, I was just too young to to, to capture punk uh, yeah. and, and and the furore that that caused. And 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 I just want to ask you, like, just to, you know, to discuss Dylan a little bit more, like, just the impact that that Bob Dylan, you know, had on you at that point. You've frozen. Oh, have I? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, that's annoying. Or you, or, no, you didn't freeze. You just stopped talking when I was expecting the rest of the question. Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> I just wanted to know uh, a little bit about how um, the, the impact as a young man that somebody as, as, as interested and as exciting and as controversial and as outspoken as Bob Dylan, like the, the impact that that had on a young man. Uh, well, he, the great thing about Dylan uh, is his capacity to reinvent himself, yeah. which uh, he retains to this day. You know, when he comes out with a new record, you've got no idea how it's going to connect back to the previous one or what references it will make to earlier points in his life. But yeah. the, the succession of records that came out in the first half dozen uh, were, were extraordinary. The, the, the way he, he kept changing, if there was a direction, he kept changing it. Um, and the fact that he didn't sound like anybody else, you know, you know, it was like his timing was rubbish. His, his tuning was like the last thing on his mind. Yeah. Uh, and he sang in a way which was so personal. It was so identifiable and, and, and it rubbed people up so much the wrong way. If they didn't like it, they really yeah. didn't like it. Yeah. But he didn't care. He didn't care if his, inter his, his, his unconventional approach to singing rendered uh, the depth and beauty of his lyrics. It, it rendered that unavailable to a lot of his listeners. A lot of people who came upon him just couldn't get past his voice. So they, they, they dismissed him out of hand. But he didn't care about that. He was following his own star. So... And a time when everything was formalized and everything was controlled by a cartel of huge companies, which um, if you weren't in with them, then you you were just like you weren't even in the game. Yeah. You know, there was there was no game. It was just like the top five or six companies. And they were, you know, monolithic. Yeah. So yeah, he represented a lot of stuff which was about independence and um, the strength of determination and a conviction in your own art and your own belief in yourself yeah. that's what he spoke of to me and of course that's always going to be a popular thing to to preach to adolescents isn't it absolutely absolutely um i i happen to be of an age where i, I kind of caught a young billy bragg happening and yeah and, and that was very similar you have a, people just could not take his voice yeah. or yeah. <laughs> you know you saw the beauty in it and that was that was what I saw and uh okay well we, we, we're talking formative years here so for track three uh Simon I'm going to ask you please to tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school um well we've talked a lot about that already haven't we but it wasn't all like walking around under a nuclear cloud I mean there was the usual sort of adolescent growing up stuff um and you know, went to youth club. Uh, that's where I met Ashley Hutchings, uh, for instance, who became, and is still is, one of my colleagues. Because uh, Ashley ran um, all the bands in our part of North London. He was a bass player and leader, and he'd have a band for every sort of occasion or musical style. And uh, his band used to play at uh, our youth club in Muswell Hill and um, on a Friday night. And uh, so that's when I saw music up close and personal being done. And I had a 12 string guitar and he didn't know anybody else who got a 12 string guitar. And even though I couldn't play it, I had it. So that was a start. Yeah. So I went into his little black book and one thing led to another. But uh, yeah, it was the music had a was beginning to have a, a, a functional form for me as well as something you listen to. But listening to music in those days, it was, you know, the early early to mid 60s was um it was a background thing of growing up and uh, you know some lovely short feel good happy songs uh romantic stuff and i don't know when um i thought of one to pick out and say this is a sort of typical piece that brings back those summers um i would say mary wells my guy has got all the benefits of you know it's proto motown mm -hmm. uh, it's got really solid playing on it lovely little catchy tune and her vocal performance is it's perfect let's face yeah. it yeah oh 100 i think you know that 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 mid-60s period of of motown was just you know it it was i guess the ultimate hit factory it was just 
churning out perfect pop music and so sweet, yet some of the lyrics were so so sad, yet the, the, the melodies were so up. It just it just gave this perfect combination of of music. And it was, yeah, I, I think that period of Motown personally, I, I think is exceptional. Yeah, and you could pick so many others. It's just, yeah. uh, you know, I selected that one, but on another day, I might have checked with something else. Yeah. <laughs> How was school as an experience? Did you enjoy it? Uh, I was, I was well, speaking personally, I was, I was quite good at school um, in the sense of academically, but that was because I was, I started really young. My, you know, I was the youngest of four, and my parents obviously found me a bit of an encumbrance being four, five years younger than my next sibling. Yeah. So I think they wanted the, their lives back a bit earlier than as soon as possible. So I was dispatched <laughs> to full time school when I was about three and a half. So by the time I got to secondary school, I was like a year ahead of everybody else because mm. they kept me hanging about, you know, when I went up to secondary school, I had to sort of do an extra year in Perda. Mm. Uh, so that kind of broke my flow, and uh, I think um, I think I might have had a different career if I if I'd remained engaged in education. Uh, I could have done quite well, but then my dad died when I was thirteen, so uh, that was a massively disruptive thing, obviously, um, and I definitely went off the boil then. So I didn't actually finish my education, but I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed my time at school. Yeah. Um, Went to very small schools. They were both primary and secondary school. Were both very small. They were, my secondary school only had a, a roster of about 140 kids, you know, which is quite small nowadays. Mm. And it was an all boys, all boys outfit as well. So I, I was kind of I, I left in my GC, GCE year uh, without really without finishing my O levels. I, I didn't even bother going to most of the exams. So I left with just the two English levels. Did you have any idea what you wanted to do then? Just get out of school, really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't hate it, but I just, I was ready to stop being a schoolboy. That was yeah. all. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to tell me the first song that you remember buying from a record shop for track four, please, Simon. Well, that's easy because it's a simple fact. It was, uh, uh, it was on a 78. I'm that old. It was actually a 78 <laughs> shellac disc. And it was a, an instrumental a piano instrumental piece called uh, The Poor People of Paris. Um, I'd have been about seven or eight when I, you know, through sort of pester power. Yeah. But I had, to, I had to actually produce the money for it, I think. Um, you know, probably three in a tanner yeah. back then. Uh, and it was by Winifred Atwell. It was, I only found out recently that it wasn't an original piece of hers. Uh, but by accident, I was a, a, an old chart from about that period in the the late 50s turned up and it was a billboard chart and the poor people of Paris was on that list yeah. by somebody else, presumably the writer. But Winifred Atwell obviously is not a name on the public's list, you know, these days, but she was a, an exotic Caribbean lady who played sort of pub piano uh, and it was very ear catchy and um, her thing was like she had a jangle box piano, you know, with drawing pins in the in the hammers. So it had this funky noise um, which appealed to my uh, single figure years wonderful and in, in and in the years that sort of followed like how important did did records and record shopping become for you not uh i didn't have a, an extensive collection no i i i listened to a lot of music but i didn't spend a lot of money on it i didn't amass a load of records which i still have no mm. um but record shops were were great places to go and and hang. Yeah. Uh, 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 particularly um, up West End, you know, we'd, we'd go and, and we'd go to Dobell's Music Shop and Collets and what was that one in? Um, the, uh, there was one in New Oxford Street, underneath um, Centre Point. Tower Records. Um, no, no, this is long before then. I'm, I'm talking um, mid sixties. Right, you know, okay. me and my mates would go. We'd go up west on uh, Saturdays and, yeah. and spend a long time looking in. Uh, but 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 uh, th by this point, I'd already uh, begun to be aware of the connection between 
music and politics. Not that I've pursued that much in my life since, but at the time, uh, there was a definite crossover between the whole CND thing, um, the, uh, the dangerous areas around left-wing politics and communism in particular, which was closely watched by MI5 and yeah. uh, the, the, the intellectual um, left wing, um, which was very much, you know, the, the literary world uh, and the music world met in the middle ground of protest music. And there were shops like Dobell's and Collett's, which were, uh, they were obviously places where people of that mindset could gather yeah. and meet you know god knows what nefarious activities went on and how many people were moles in there working for mi5 yeah but, uh, it was there was a there was a countercultural element to it yeah do you yeah, feel exciting shop. um not now but anybody who's not uh, anti-establishment and and extremely and extremely left wing in their teenage years it's obviously got a gene missing yeah absolutely <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I know that um, when I sent this question over, I asked you to, uh, to tell me the song that soundtrack your years clubbing. Uh, you, you, you sent me over a message saying uh, you, you've not been yet. Um, yeah. That, that question can lend itself. So I'm going to put you on the spot here, Simon, um, to just the sort of formative years of, of, of pubs and gigs, like a, a song that if you hear now will take you back to them sort of times as, as a young man well yeah i was clubbing sort of to me suggests a, um, a fairly lose yourself in the moment kind of physical involvement of dance and and overpowering sensations of live repetitive that pounding this you know where you, where you just like get your body massaged by exhaustion physical energy and it, that's not me yeah but i used to go uh, fridays friday nights i would usually go to the manor house which is a big public house was a big public house just the other side of finsbury park which had a big upstairs room victorian roadhouse typical you know london pub and they had a great music room up there and they put on all the great bands so you know uh It'd be invidious to single anybody out, but you'd, you know, you'd see Zoot Money, you'd see Georgie Fame, you'd see John May, or uh, you'd see The Who, uh, and any of those bands. Gino Washington, oh. uh, you know, fantastic live music, you know, sweaty, people absolutely rammed in, yeah. deafening sound. But, you know, there wasn't any dancing going on. It was just like a load of adolescent fellas sort of getting off on the music. Yeah. So uh, they are being pounded by it in that physical way. So I suppose you could go to that period if you wanted something akin to clubbing. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was blessed to see uh, Gino played my venue um, probably, oh God, 20 years ago now. Um, uh, and, and, and he was phenomenal then. Um, yeah. How was that in, 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 in the 60s seeing Gino? I mean, it's, I mean, it's great, but I mean, he didn't stand head and shoulders above anybody else. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like Brian Auger, you know, get, um, I saw an early cream gig there, you know, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it was like all seven and a tanner and you'd get like, you'd nurse a pint of Guinness all night. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> most of it would end up knocked down your trousers and yeah, it was wonderful. All very formative stuff. Well, for track six, I'm going to take you home, Simon, and ask you to tell me a favourite song from an artist from your home county, please. Um, yeah, OK, this is literally off the top of my head. Um, I've only lived in, in Kent now for seven years. And one of the people I've met since I've been down here is Will Varley, who's a young singer-songwriter. Say young. I mean, he, you know, he's younger than me. But yeah. most people are, <laughs> and he deserves to be better known. Okay. And it, he has a song called uh, "The Man Who Fell to Earth," and it's not to be confused with any by David Bowie. Sure, but uh, it's 
he will represents to me the very best of the the um, troubadour tradition, if you can call Bob Dylan a troubadour. Yeah. But uh, uh, a man who creates his own music and is able to perform it in a perfect Bob Dylan-sized package. Yeah. Will Varley does the same with Will Varley stuff. There we go. Wonderful. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you as well because um, I know that you're talking about Kent and and and, and the time that you've lived there. Uh, I you did also send over something which I, I want to sort of ask you about, and that was you did also mention Waterloo Sunset by Ray Davis. Yeah. yeah. So have you, can you tell me a bit more sort of around uh, if, that as an option yeah. as well? If we go back to uh, my home county, as you were, of uh, where I literally, you know, cut my teeth and grew up, uh, you know, my home, my house, my family home was called Fairport. Yeah. And it still is. It's in Muswell Hill. Um, it was my dad's place of work as well as where we lived. It's a doctor's surgery and he was a GP. And amongst his GP his duties was, uh, he was family doctor to the Quaifs who had a son called Pete, who was the bass player, grew up and to be the bass player in, in the Kings. And uh, the Davis brothers uh, lived in a little house directly opposite the Cliss Old Arms, which was about 400 yards from our house, our front door. And that was the pub my mum and dad used to go to. Uh, so they knew the Davises as you know, people who lived opposite the pub. So I, I grew up very much aware of the Davises as... Uh, I mentioned the, the youth club earlier. Um, the Ravens, which was the name the Kinks had before they became the Kinks, were one of the bands that used to play at our uh, youth club. And I went to their last gig as the Ravens. Uh, and I went to their first gig as the Kinks when they were reinvented. Yeah. Uh, just about the time that they were signing up to Pie and they got a new manager and he got them dressed up in outfits and, you know, the hunting coats and all that styled them up. And uh, that coincided with the release of You Really Got Me and they became a number one act just like that. But we went to their very first gig as the, as the Kings and uh, that was in the church hall down in, down Muswell Hill in Hornsey. And uh, so I sort of knew them at one remove. They were just uh, that little bit older than me. So I didn't know them personally. And they were a little bit rougher too, because you know they went to the, yeah. the rougher part of town, you know, rougher part of Muswell Hill. Uh, but uh, Waterloo Sunset, I think, uh, is Davis's first really poetic song. The first one that I heard, which was uh, more than just attempting to be a hit song. Not yeah. it's, it's, it has so much more than its lyrics contain. It's a proper verbal poem you know yeah. and a love and a love song to uh, to london seeing all of these bands just up the road you know you mentioned the who and obviously now the kinks and and, and such mm. and, and gino etc but often when i speak to guests that that sort of live outside of london you know in, in their home county they may have like a history of like maybe one or two artists that, that went on to, to 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 you know to have success in the music industry um, being surrounded by so much music and at that time where, where, where bands, as you said, the, about the kinks, like literally, you know, quite quickly, the minute, you know, you really got me come out, they become superstars and, and, and household names. Like seeing all of that, did that as somebody that was, you know, that, that had a, had a guitar and, and was interested in music, did it, did it all seem that like, oh right, this is this is possible. You you know you can pick up a yeah. guitar and these things these things you know can happen. Yeah, well at, at that particular time, when when we became uh, when we took the name Fairport Convention, it was in May 1967. I mean the, the tides were really running in our direction. Yeah, live music was a, as a absolutely vital part of society. It was yeah. it was ubiquitous. It was in every pub had a back room or a top room. Yeah, there were a million places to play. You know and So it was a perfect outlet for young people. Yeah. Um, so I loved it. Yeah, I was, I was very fortunate that the stars aligned in that way. Yeah, and uh, I think it was about two months after we 
change the name to Fairport Convention. Um, we got a gig at UFO, which was one of the big London happening places to be. Uh, we were supporting Pink Floyd that night and um, Joe Boyd happened to be there, who was one of the organizers, part-time organizers of UFO along with John Hopkins. And uh, he liked what he saw. He particularly liked Richard Thompson, obviously, because of his free flowing, completely original approach to guitaring. But he liked the whole vibe of the band. And um, he spoke to us about becoming our manager and signed us uh, to a record company. So we went, you know, from really hopeful semi-pros to properly signed musicians on a wage just like that inside two months so yes as you say you had a guitar and everybody knew had a guitar and played four chords yeah so uh, but we got we got uh, you know in the right place right time sort of thing and um, yeah. so we went you know we became sort of professional and, and the sky was blue the sky was limitless and the sky was uh, where we were heading wonderful um, for the last track, Simon, I'm going to ask you um, to tell me a song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to hear. Uh, I a go-to song in this, to this kind of question is 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 nine times out of ten I'm going to come up with "Sand and Water" by Beth Nielsen Chapman. Okay. Um, Beth is a, a Nashville-based singer-songwriter. Uh, I first encountered her and my good pal, Paul Samuel Smith, who was bass player in the Yardbirds and went on to be a, uh, a fantastically successful song producer and artist liaison guy, uh, records too numerous to mention and very successful at it. He called me up and said, um, got this American girl coming over She's got a bunch of songs. Um, I'm trying to put together a studio band. Would you be interested? You know, spend a fortnight in a residential studio with some people, some of whom you know, some of whom you don't, and just knock these songs into shape. Uh, the diary was fortunately free, and there I was, you know, suddenly in, in this whole new world of completely different songs. Beth's... Um, a beautiful tunesmith and a wonderful songwriter and she can be insanely up and joyous there's a great song of hers called this kiss um, which is a massive grammy award-winning country hit uh, and she can write songs to make you punch you in the heart in yeah. a good way yeah and sand and water uh is one of the songs that came out of her losing her husband to cancer uh, probably 20 years ago, 25 years ago now, maybe. Um, it speaks for itself. I can't, I can't big it up, okay. but uh, let it move you. Well, we, we make it quite straightforward for people to, to, to go and access these records. We put together a little playlist to accompany the podcast and the, and the link to that will yeah. be in the show notes to, to this episode. Um, so we're seeing that, that, that 2022 is starting to appear to be a, a, a more COVID-free place. I don't know, you know. Well, COVID adapted. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's still there in abundance, but we seem to be kind of, you know, pressing on and which we're seeing lots of gigs happening again, festivals happening again, um, and, and, and people sort of seemingly enjoying each other's company in, in public places again. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you uh, what you're looking forward to from the rest of this year, personally, Simon, and what's uh, going to be happening professionally. Well, uh, we have already completed uh, our usual winter tour, having give, had to give that a miss last year. We did complete it in 2020. On the 23rd of February, we finished that winter wow. tour. So we did that all the way through. And then a week later, it all like the world fell in, the sky fell in. So we missed it last year. We've, um, and of course we missed our spring tour. We missed the Crockerty Festival, two years running now. 
so we're easing back into it. We had a, a very successful run of five weeks, although it turned into six weeks because we lost two weeks in the middle to COVID. There you go. <laughs> you know, two guys in the band came down with it and we had to take two weeks out uh, and tighten up the bubble. Uh, and we resumed and finished and put an extra week on the end of the cancelled gigs. So looking forward to getting out again in another two weeks time for a, a spring tour where we're going to, I'm afraid, going to have to continue to keep uh, as private as we can, as, as, as isolated from our adoring fans, which is terrible, really, because the whole fun of going out and touring is not just getting on stage and making the noises and singing the songs and, and having that simple pleasure that you have within yourselves to an audience. Uh, it's actually enjoying the business of traveling around, yeah. uh, being with friends, you know, being with people you see just at gigs or, or when you visit their hometowns, just can't do that yeah. because there's a whole bunch of us on the road and we, we've all got to be well or it all stops. So it's, you know, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm kind of dreading it being interrupted again. Yeah. But you can only do so much to protect yourself. We are all vaccinated to the hilt, same as everybody else is. And at least now when people do uh, fall victim to it, it's not, the end of the world it doesn't mean a trip to hospital it doesn't yeah. mean you know you're living on a knife edge it doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to be stricken for months to come with the after effects uh so it is as you say we're beginning to ease back towards the kind of normal interactions that we but i, I don't think it's going to be uh back to normal 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 mm -hmm. for some time to come but yes, I'm looking forward to that and I'm particularly looking forward to the Crocodile Festival, which has always been for the last 40 plus years, been the, the linchpin of my year and for everybody in the Fairport's world, you know, are getting together with 20,000 or so people who've somehow or other been touched by Fairport in the last 55 years. And it's a place of not pilgrimage, that makes it sound ridiculous, but it's a place of collective community. Nice. And uh, it's it means something else, you know, to have, you know, we're a small band. We don't, you know, we've never bothered the record industry. We've never made any money for anybody. But we've created a community of, of souls who have this one thing in common. And, uh, you know, if I get knocked down by a bus tomorrow, I will at least have been part of something that I couldn't have possibly imagined when I left school all those years ago. That's a lovely place to, to finish today's episode, Simon. I'm good um, at that. <laughs> if people want to find out all about the festival um, and tours and stuff, head to the website. Yeah, all the W's, fairfallconvention.com. Wonderful. Simon, it's been an absolute pleasure talking records with you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and yeah, and best of luck with the gigs and festivals this year. And good luck with the editing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. Cheers now. Press stop here.